happy to turn it over to you to introduce yourself and uh, and uh, get started. We'll do so. so what I'm going to do uh, in this presentation uh, is to go through about six to seven pages that's just basically sort of the philosophy and understanding behind the LibreTex project, uh, and then going into some of the nittier gritty details of the things. Um, I'm in <clears throat> encumbered a bit uh, by the complexity of my project and trying to put it into a simple bow tie um, that's out here, but it's important, I think, in order to understand why we do what we do uh, and why I think that the approach that we're doing is a, uh, uh, is a good approach for, uh, for putting it down there. Okay, um, so this is roughly the agenda that we're gonna go to, that you, you gave me, uh, at least the three points. I'm gonna go back to this uh, after I'm done with the presentation, but I just always wanna start with the agenda. And let me start with the mission statement. Uh, so uh, we're implementing a community built OER platform uh, for the, and I define platform in this case here, the construction, curation, adoption, and adaption of OER material. That's comprehensive and can be curated at multiple levels. So you can vision this as a three C's that underlies how we operate. One is community, which basically means that we're trying to get as many people involved in this project because the more people who are involved, the more people that benefit from what we're doing. Um, plat or OER, not platform, means free. And I'm going to presume everybody here knows that's not entirely the formal definition, but we're going to ignore that for now. <clears throat> Comprehensive basically means that we, uh, while I, as a chemistry faculty member of the University of California, Davis, uh, uh, started the LibreText project as the ChemWiki, uh, it, it's expanded to being very comprehensive, both vertically and horizontally uh, across multiple fields and from uh, pre-K all the way up to graduate level uh, stuff. Uh, we also we follow a no gap left behind policy in order to fill up all the gaps, and there are lots of gaps in order to be filled. Uh, and we follow a no tech left behind policy, which basically means that when emerging technology is generated, uh, we take it, embed it, and make it so that other people on our platform can then take advantage of that. And we go through that effort so that other people don't need to. And lastly, and this is exceedingly important, is that the, uh, the content that we have is uh, curatable, which means it's a living library that you have the ability to come in, edit, and move forward, and do it in such a constructive way that it doesn't require unnecessary pain an effort um, off of that. <clears throat> so just as a little bit of an impact, if you're unfamiliar with the LibreText project, we're the largest central repository of living uh, content on the internet today. Uh, we deliver somewhere in the order of 700 to 800 million page views a day. Um, and we've distributed somewhere close to two thirds of a billion with a B uh, page view since we started. Um, so we're operating at scale and there are lots of other numbers and statistics and things like that that may or may not necessarily impress you. Uh, but I can certainly give you them if you're interested in terms of how we operate uh, off of that. So, um, sorry, I co-opted some slides off of here. Uh, there are multiple reasons why people are interested in OER, and I do this just as a, a reference point to, to work off of. Uh, we could be interested in, in trying to make textbooks affordable, um, uh, or we could be interested in trying to make the textbook of the future, and the ability in order to augment and push things forward. And, and I argue, uh, and this is a, not it shouldn't be a philosophical, but it's my perspective that uh, uh, that the cost argument for OER is just a proxy for the real argument. And the real argument is that the cost is inversely or adversely affecting our educational mission because students are unable to purchase the book, which then has detrimental effects on our educational thing. So uh, I, I feel that money is uh, is not uh, the end thing uh, off of here. So. <clears throat> um, there are three aspects on how the LibreText project is, is formulated. Uh, it, it is viewed uh, in part as a platform for construction of content, OER content, uh, as the dissemination of platform. And again, we're the largest, uh, most popular, most visited uh, platform for OER distribution uh, and as a learning platform. Um, and these are all particularly important for the way that we operate. But as an educator um, who is making OER and using OER uh, in the classroom, uh, I'm particularly interested in the learning platform. That's what we've been focusing on a lot recently. <clears throat> so the LibreText project um, is a, a catch-all term in order to describe an ecosystem of various components that are all meant in order to play together well uh, and integrate into a, uh, a product that's much greater than the sum of the parts. That ecosystem we call the Libreverse, and the core of the Libreverse uh, are our libraries. So we have 14, 13, 15 libraries, depending upon how you count uh, each library, uh, that hosts the content that we have. We have somewhere in the order, the last I counted, about a third of a million page views 
uh, sorry, third of a million pages uh, across our libraries. Chemistry is the most developed because it was the initial one that we started with back in uh, 2007. Uh, <clears throat> um, and we chose a technology uh, of uh, wiki-based technology because we knew that we were trying to make something that's meant in order to operate at scale for collaborative construction efforts. Uh, and one can argue, and I think confidently, that a wiki-based technology is the ideal technology for large-scale collaborative construction efforts. The, its approach is a centralized approach, which keeps everything cent uh, uh, obviously centralized and within the same uh, infrastructure. And that has some key benefits uh, uh, in terms of being able to effectively share, effectively use, effectively remix. The opposite of that would be a fragmented infrastructure where content is distributed in a variety of different spots. And I believe that that's actually one of the bigger problems that the OER community is gonna have to deal with because when people are multiply, are optimizing and upgrading at different spots in different places. We don't have a centralized revision infrastructure across uh, the ecosystem of, um, of the OER. And that's, I think, encumbering us. Anyways, um, <clears throat> uh, surrounding our central libraries are ancillary technologies in order to augment um, uh, the content that's stored on our libraries. Uh, so that includes a homework infrastructure, which we have released softly uh, over the last a uh, couple of months, uh, and Brian here has been using it for the last six six months, I think. I can't remember if it was a, a session. Uh, <clears throat> that is designed to do a variety of different things. Uh, in order to do that justice, I need a lot more time. Uh, if you're interested in talking about the homework infrastructure, I'm certainly willing in order to go into and why we did what we did and why it took time in order to be able to build that. We have an ancillary uh, uh, technology of the Jupyter Notebook system that gives us the ability to, to embed executable code into our, our pages and control that. And we have 30 different languages as part of the Jupyter Notebook system, but only six or seven of them are the common ones that we have embedded are off the Python, uh, Sage Math, and such. So that basically is part of our effort in order to build the textbook of the future. Um, and that's also uh, important for me as a chemist, a physical chemist, uh, I need those sort of tools in order to uh, teach my students. We have a JavaScript uh, server, actually multiple ones in order to store these technologies as they uh, come out and move things forward. We have a learning analytics infrastructure uh, in place in order to evaluate how students uh, uh, review, sorry, use the content that we have here. And that's useful in order to provide instructors of record uh, learning analytics on their students. It's also useful for in, order, in order to evaluate the efficacy of the textbooks that are created because 99.9% .9 of all OER books do not have an efficacy evaluation or what they're read, or really doing what they're trying to do. Um, although most of the time they are. We have a bot server uh, and this is designed in order to be able to allow bots to go through and update the libraries. This is particularly important because it's a centralized system which means that when we find things that we need to fix uh, collectively, we can run the bot in order to update it. That means everything is centralized and standardized and that provides exceedingly important capabilities for remixing. Anyone who's ever tried to remix content from a PDF, uh, from a LaTeX source and from a Word document understands the difficulties of different formats and different styles. <laughs> the Navigator I'll mention later on, which is gonna be coming out next year, which is sort of a learning tool in order to tie everything together instead of being individual components. We have a series of forums uh, in order to facilitate community conversations, uh, both within the Libreverse um, uh, and outside, again, trying to benefit from the general community. Um, so I give this slide oftentimes, you know, we're all OER experts in here, so we understand that there's a variety of content uh, out there in the OER infrastructure and they're, and they're found in a variety of different places. Um, and one of the problems that we've had for a long time is trying to find where the content is. Um, and we have various repositories or repertories out there in order to find them. Uh, and then we have a vast uh, amount of OER content or what would be constituted as OER content on individual faculties, hard drives that have largely haven't been tapped into because they have been sitting on hard drives and things like that. The key point is that OER is heavily fragmented in a variety of different places, a variety of different formats. Uh, and it encumbers our ability in order to move forward. So it's a lot of effort in order to be able to find effective mechanisms to find content and effective mechanisms in order to uh, combine the content. Uh, <clears throat> I forgot a few more, and there are obviously many more, certainly in the last couple of years that OER has really uh, uh, blossomed. What we are trying to do is to take all that content, all the OER infrastructure, um, uh, sorry, all the OER that's on the infrastructure and bring it into our platform. So we use the term harvesting in order to describe that effort. 
Uh, and sometimes that's easy. For example, we can take a Pressbooks instance or any EPUB, uh, EPUB 2 uh, output and embed it directly into the system. And we need to do some cleanup in order to make sure the standards are up to our standards. Um, but we can, all, but we have things, formats from LaTeX, um, PDFs, uh, which are painful, handwritten notes and things like that. So as part of our harvesting effort, uh, I have a team of about 100 undergraduate students well-trained uh, and their job is to take projects of OER and I hand it off to them and I say, here it is, integrate it. Um, and they bring it in and they convert it into the standards that we want to be able to establish the accessibility standards. If it involves math, we need to go through uh, LaTeXizing, which fortunately in the last couple of years has become a lot easier than it was before thanks to OCR technology uh, and make it so all the things are standardized so that we can easily mix and match them such that the OER infrastructure on the Libreverse is standardized, compartmentalized, has a framework infrastructure in order to find it, keywords or, uh, or any of the type of frameworks that you want to implement or schemas that you put into place. So that you could find content, cross-reference content from one page to another page, one library to another library, um, uh, and make that all so they are, are interchangeable like Lego blocks. Uh, so then in other words, when you're trying to build a book, you essentially have a bigger bucket of Legos, which is what we're trying to do. Uh, and this is the approach that we feel is the right way in order to move forward. Uh, and we're fortunate in order to have the resources in order to be doing this quite extensively uh, off the case. So it's centralized, it's standardized, it's interconvertible, and you can generate collections if you want, AKA books uh, uh, or remixes, or you can even generate um, repository or sub repositories focusing on specific learning objectives like laboratories, uh, for example. It provides a, a near infinite flexibility uh, and organization and hierarchical organization. And if you have the right technology, for example, the OER remixer that we established, it makes it very powerful. And more importantly, everything is a living library, which means it's curatable, at least the content that's not NB licensed, which is uncuratable, uh, that's hosted on our site. So when you find something, you find a mistake and there are mistakes on every book everywhere out there, you fix it and then it's no longer a problem. It's no longer a problem across our whole library. That's the centralization. In contrast to fragmented inf infrastructure, that problem persists on multiple sites on multiple instances of that book uh, that's out there. That is my overview of the project uh, off of it. I can't even tell what time it is. So I'm going to, I got a new phone. Okay, fine. Okay. Um, <laughs> Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, uh, so I, I just want to make sure I laid the grain, uh, groundwork in terms of how we have implemented uh, uh, what we do and what we constitute this Libreverse uh, that we uh, pull in. The key point off of this thing is that we built these things as faculty members. Uh, so 99% of my team are faculty, with the exception of the students, obviously, that are doing the, the curation, but the development team are faculty, uh, and all of us are academics. So we view these things in terms from a very practical perspective of how we actually want to implement them in the lab. That's convenient because we have uh, essentially no uh, development time between building something and evaluating something. We can actually implement it and run it forward after that. So let me skip over that and actually go into a presentation uh, into these things. So the way we, like I said, I have a short amount of time, um, although things are much better than I thought they were. Um, and so I could peruse a range of different aspects associated with our, our infrastructure. Uh, uh, let me log out uh, so you don't see an administrative perspective. Each of our core libraries on our uh, on our wiki is an independent wiki. Sorry, uh, of our hub is an independent wiki-based technology. And again, the wiki-based technology was designed well, was designed for large-scale collaborative construction efforts. Exactly what we wanted to be able to do. The other aspect of why we chose a wiki is that. There are a lot of different techniques or a lot of different mechanisms you, you can select in order to be able to distribute a website. Uh, uh, and even all the way down to a text file with an Apache background off of that. And what you see when you see a website may be nearly identical from one instance to another instance. The real difference uh, from what the LibreText provides is all the stuff behind the scenes. It's all the thinking in order to be able to evaluate how things are connected, how you're actually implemented. We have a powerful API infrastructure. We have a powerful programming language that's integrated into our platform that gives us the ability in order to do a variety of different things that we wouldn't be able to do on less sophisticated uh, technologies. And that's what we get in terms of using the technology that we uh, we have uh, built upon. Uh, 
So each of our libraries uh, is essentially a massive hero. Uh, and a book constitutes a snippet of that hierarchy. Uh, so it all becomes one collective infrastructure. And I argue that this is beneficial for a variety of reasons. One reason that I push a lot is the way we want to teach our students is to understand the synergy of content from one field to another field. Uh, so I don't see the benefit of actually keeping things compartmentalized uh, so that you have a single book. I think we need to break out of that paradigm and start to envision the whole infrastructure of content and how you can distribute and move from one content one page to another page that reflects the same concept, but used in different ways. Uh, just the way that we typically would use the internet, but again, standardized, centralized uh, off of it. So <clears throat> uh, every library that we have uh, has four, sorry, four, I, I can count here, three primary top uh, level components. Uh, we have the bookshelves, or sometimes they're referred to as the centralized bookshelves. We have the campus bookshelves. We have the learning objects. Um, so again, <clears throat> the base aspect of our wiki is every single page, every single entry in the big database constitutes a page on our site. We organize them in the way that we want to be able to do that. We separate things that are centralized, which is the, uh, the content oftentimes stored as books uh, that is curated by the development team um, or by feedback from the external people in the community that give us uh, the information in order to be able to update our central bookshelves. So that's when we bring things that are canonically stored together, stored on there, so everyone has access to it. You have access to everything on here, uh, unless you decide you want to close it off. And most faculty don't do that because that goes a little bit against the, the OER aspect, the O and OER. But the key point is that on any of the libraries, you can go into the bookshelves. Uh, the bookshelves are organized differently because different fields. Every library deals with a different field or a different set of fields. So it's organized differently. This, this is chemistry because it's my go-to library. Uh, and you can see I've organized in eight different uh, sections in order to facilitate a semantic identification of content. We have the ability in order to find things via the search infrastructure, uh, which can be which you can search on keywords, meta tags, natural language, and all the stuff like that in order to be able to facilitate identifying these things. So if I go to general chemistry, now get a calendar. If you go to general chemistry, you then see a series of books that we have here. We have two, actually we have three types of books or collections on here. One are called books, and those are meant to be original content, uh, not necessarily original to the development team on the Libertex, but it was original somewhere else that we brought in. For example, the OpenStax book, uh, which we've been removing the book uh, moniker just to make things a little bit simpler off of here. Um, or the Chem uh, One uh, content, or the Chem Prime content uh, that's brought in here. We also have a different infrastructure that we've uh, been pursuing for a while, which we call text maps. And text maps are collections of OER content that's designed to follow the organization of an existing book. And that is designed in order to facilitate rapid switching, sort of the Indiana Jones uh, situation of sand with whatever that mask was uh, in the, the first movie, uh, that you could say, here's the organization of the book that you like, all with OER content. Uh, and it's a text map off of it. And then we have remixes. Um, remixes, uh, as we know, are just basically, uh, well, this, this can oftentimes be part of a remix, although it may be customized to, uh, on the content on the page in order to address uh, specific components of that organization. Remixes are oftentimes organized by an individual uh, faculty member or department, uh, and those things are then typically stored in campus bookshelves. Uh, so the content that we have here is organized by each individual campus, and then when you go to your campus, you're then able to find the book that you have here. And since I see Brian on here, I'm going to go to the medicine library, which is where we have the nutrition, and again, I'm going to sign out so you don't actually, I need to sign back in because um, I'm going to go to his book and his book is locked uh, for only his students to see as part of the collaboration. So, so this basically provides the opportunity for a faculty member to have a book, curate the book, own the book, becomes your mind, your precious, however you want to go about doing that thing. And you can, and it's 100% it's yours. The stuff that's in the central library is curated centrally. Um, and by the development team. So we don't get involved in the curation of the uh, the course bookshelves, the campus bookshelves, unless asked for as part of our agreement or so of that, but we focus a lot on curating the centralized bookshelf with one exception, and that we have two bots that are designed in order to go through our libraries in order to handle either standardization 
which we call the Brad bot because it's named after Brad Pitt in order to go to a page and make it pretty. The, the second bot is the Alley bot that comes in and it handles as much accessibility things that can't be handled automatically, uh, which is largely mostly everything with the exception of alt text, uh, which requires a human in order to do that. And we have a different team in order to focus on uh, accessibility. And then we let essentially the content stored here to be curated by the department, the faculty member, and we move forward off of that. That means that the centralized approach that we have has the benefits of centralization, but the, but the and the benefits of a decentralized infrastructure in order to customize what you're doing, but bringing it all together in order to be able to make an infrastructure that's very powerful so that when someone comes in and they say they like Brian's book, they can adopt Brian's book, they can copy it, remix it, or transclude, which is a term that I use, in, not use it, it's a formal term, in order to describe whether content stored on one page, but really is copied on another page. And that's meant in order to facilitate effective curation of content across those. And I can talk about that in detail. Am I talking too fast? I'm sorry, I'm trying to uh, make I'm sure- I'm from New York, so I'm with you, but I don't know about I'm in Washington <laughs> There you go. And I still haven't had anyone wants him to slow down. Just just put a note in the chat. <laughs> OK, uh, there you go. Uh, OK, so um, the uh, let me see what's in the medicine learning objects. So learning objects uh, are meant to store content that doesn't come together in conventional textbook uh, collaborate uh, collectors. Uh, so, for example, laboratories. So it provides a mechanism in order to centralize these things. You can go into a laboratory. I'm not sure what type of laboratories and the medicine library. So you can look at various laboratories that are organized. Uh, I oftentimes try to uh, break these things apart into uh, individual components of laboratories and organize it. Right now, it's still uh, based on individual collections. Um, uh, and such. But then you have the ability to find worksheets. And such. So you can think of these as learning objects uh, so you can grab and use as needed for your individual class. So let me show you what you can do. This is the class that I. Um, I gave my final in yesterday. This class uh, almost killed me. Uh, it was a 400 student class. Uh, and this is the, uh, the book. And I use the term book very loosely here because we're using this as a mixture between a textbook infrastructure and a learning management system of sorts. So we have the ability for students in order to have a, an agenda in order to go through their book um, and then identify uh, the, uh, the sections. We have the textbook that we have here. We have a series of worksheets because I have a, a team of TAs that are then are facilitating uh, these things. I have uh, extra credit, which students are using the platform as a mechanism in order to edit, peer review, and process forward. And we have a lot of best practices in order to facilitate that. So that's our open pedagogy component using the technology that we have in order to, be able to facilitate that. And ADAPT, uh, these are basically the questions that we have used as part of our homework system that's connected with this class. So I have questions for labs because our labs are integrated into our ADAPT, discussion questions, uh, homework. I have several different types of homeworks and exams that you can see. Uh, so we generated some on the order of a thousand plus questions for this class, which is one of the reasons why it almost killed me this, this last quarter. Uh, the key point here is not necessarily to, to say this is the framework in order to use. The key point is that you have a lot of freedom in order to dictate what hierarchy you actually want to use for your course. I use the term very, course very loosely here. All this content can be uh, exported as common cartridge and then inverted, embedded into learning management systems. Uh, uh, and such. And these things can also be exported uh, as individual files. Um, and the students can actually purchase the book directly. Uh, we have an API set up in order to make it so that the um, content of the book gets pushed off to Lulu Express, um, where we don't, we just basically hand off money. We don't take anything. That way we don't need to deal with non-commercial clause issues, uh, although we could. Uh, and students can get, can get the book directly uh, off of it. So that chemistry book is $13 plus some money for shipping, depending on how fast I want to. We can export uh, in uh, PDFs. Uh, we can export uh, in uh, common cartridges. Uh, in a few months, we'll have export in EPUB 3, which is necessary in order to enable the JavaScript capabilities that we have across our platform in order to split that out. We can also export in our own custom XML uh, uh, output, which is only really useful for uh, uh, intra uh, LibreText uh, uh, sharing and our 
partners that we do studies on analysis and things like that. Um, so um, that's the general organization of each library. You can go to any of the libraries and you can still see that same approach uh, that, that's, that's put there. Um, okay, so um, let me, uh, let me actually see what the agenda was uh, that you, you guys had asked. This is the wrong. Okay, <clears throat> so um, that is the the library component uh, uh, of our our platform. Uh, so what we've been releasing is uh, you know the value added component on our content. Well, I should should mention this. So let me go to one of these pages. Let's let's go to st chelation uh, page. So each page itself uh, is a typical website. Most people don't see the page settings unless you're logged in off of that. And you have the ability to get the PDF of the book and the chapter uh, when it's actually part of the chapter uh, off of here. Uh, we have a set of readability uh, components where you can just dictate how you actually want to see uh, the site, the page width, page size, uh, if, you, if you want to change the, the font, uh, uh, the organization. Um, <clears throat> this is the organization sidebar. We have this infrastructure and I think we just refresh this and we might, okay, here it does. Um, and this is designed in order to handle uh, dyslexic students primarily, although it does beneficial students that are non-dyslexic. And it basically provides a color gradient as you read across the screen. So the last color of that line is then the starting color of the next line. It's, an, it's the color of the, of the next line. And that means it, it goes on. There's evidence in our argument that this accelerates reading uh, by 20 to 30%. Um, and for dyslexic students, this is exceedingly uh, important in order to be able to uh, couple through, uh, to read. And you have a range of other things, according to dark mode and such like that. Uh, <clears throat> and we're going to have a few additional features coming on here in terms of high contrast and other aspects in order to facilitate uh, accessibility requirements. Um, then we have a range of accessibility. Um, so in this case here, the chemistry library, we have the periodic table that we uh, have established. Um, and then we have a set of uh, community forums, which I'll show in a moment uh, that's out there. And then developers then have access to our construction guide and a range of other technologies or other links that are particularly important in order to be able to move forward. And again, I don't have the time to go over all these things, but if there's something on here that particularly interests you, I can certainly go through that. Um, uh, and the contents, just the table of contents uh, that's that's involved in there. And I, uh, just to make my life a little bit nicer, I'm gonna go back to default. Uh, so uh, it's up there. So the key point is for it to be uh, uh, flexible off of that. We have two annotation systems on our pages. Uh, uh, right now, by default, we run it with uh, Hypothesis, which we partner with for a few different things. We also have Nota Bene, which is a precursor to Hypothesis. That some of my, uh, uh, faculty uh, use as a um, uh, as a message uh, as a method for uh, greater student engagement in, in the classroom um, and um, I, I can go over it a little bit but I'm probably uh, not the best person to talk about uh, uh, about no gaming because they don't use it um, off of there although there will be a presentation in the California OER Cal OER uh, state meeting that I'm co-organizing if you're interested in that Okay, so um, uh, let me talk about uh, the homework system. Um, so the ADAPT homework system is meant in order to host a variety of, uh, do a variety of different things. Um, uh, so the in intent of the homework system is as a composite system. Uh, so the, the, the point is that we didn't want to uh, adopt one specific technology that may be popular out there. Um, because no one technology is useful for every different field. And our scope is to be able to be as inclusive as possible uh, off of that. For example, H5P, while getting popular, has serious issues in terms of accessibility and security. It also is not terribly useful for many aspects of math. And certainly for upper divisional classes, its utility is quite limited. In that case there, we built a system that's designed in order to operate for the auto grading part on three different technologies, H5P, web work um, and my open math. So all three technologies are core components that we have implemented into our, our system and that they can all be integrated directly into our platform. So for example, uh, let's go to my class that I taught right now and I'm gonna go into the final exam that I gave yesterday. Uh, 
so this is the exam that I have put in place. Uh, and what we have is that each of our technologies are running on its own server, and this is an overlay on top of that. Um, and since I'm logged in as an instructor, I can even tell what the results are for this class, this specific true-false question uh, that we have here. So true-false questions and multiple choice are pretty uh, simple uh, and oftentimes inane questions to put on exams. I'm forced to do that for uh, my department. Um, but we can also then implement a more sophisticated questioning, which I don't think I did here. Most of these things are, are open-ended. Um, so the second side of our auto grading capability is the ability in order to facilitate, build a facilitated infrastructure to allow grading uh, uh, to be effective. Uh, and that's useful when you have TAs. It's also useful when you are an instructor and you don't uh, want to spend lots of time in order to go through that. So our approach is based off of grade scope and grade scope um, uh, for the, as for the open ended grading. Uh, uh, allows the opportunity for instructors and graders, I'll just plug in with that, to be able to select a, a specific question that they have and essentially be able to, uh, are we recording this or not? Um, so let me- We are recording. Actually, okay, then I'm not, um, then I'm in violation of FERPA showing you uh, those things. So I'm not gonna continue that. Um, the key point is that you're able to cut through uh, problems uh, by each student or cut through each student by each problem uh, organized off. Um, and again, you didn't specifically ask about the homework system, so I won't go into it, but I can talk about it. The, the, with one, I'll end it with one uh, aspect, and that is the, the reason we call this thing ADAPT is it's designed in order to uh, be flexible enough to implement adaptive learning capabilities. Um, so the initial uh, approach for doing that is to build what's called decision trees or learning trees uh, out there. So you can actually build this thing. So questions are not just a single question, which is let's say a traditional way in order to provide homework. You're essentially providing a tree uh, uh, with a, a certain topography in order to be able to say that when a student gets this wrong, they then have the ability in order to propagate through different branches of this tree that might focus on specific learning objectives or it could be scaffold in order to facilitate that. There are a variety of different philosophies in terms of how you can organize these trees uh, effectively, uh, but it provides a mechanism. This, let me There's lots of evidence to argue that just this very simplistic non-AI based approach is immensely more powerful than just conventional question. We could take these questions and we can embed them into our textbook. Um, as we did for with Brian's uh, book, you can access them directly through ADAPT. You can embed them into learning management systems. Canvas is the one that we've, we've done that. And they're designed in order to be used as clickers. Um, so if you have real, if you want engagement in class, you can actually facilitate that. Um, and we're working on an app in order to uh, facilitate that. Approach. So um, there's a culturally responsive pedagogy component of this thing and a few other things, but I'm gonna end here because that's not really, uh, what you asked it to take away. Okay, I have a few more minutes, uh, so let me uh, go over a, a few things. So one of the capabilities that we have by keeping things centralized um, uh, and standardized is the ability in order to effectively remix content. So we have access, uh, we built this, this technology we call the Remixer, which gives us the ability in order to construct a new book by using any pages on our whole library. So all 330,000 pages that we have any person can come in uh, in order to remix content from any of those pages that they put in there. And it's a very simple drag and drop approach in order to be able to, uh, to work that. So I'm gonna go into organic chemistry, everyone's favorite topic, uh, and then go into uh, organic chemistry lab techniques. And you can build a book uh, on, the, on the right hand side here by just dragging and dropping onto the left hand side. This is the best technology I believe out there, although I'm biased, in order to facilitate uh, easy mixing of content. And as you remix content from different uh, sites or different pages, um, then they get automatically numbered because of our auto renumber. You can come in and decide that you want to delete certain things and it automatically shifts it out. And if we've done things properly on the individual pages, when we actually change the number on the title, it then changes all equation numbers, all figure numbers, and all table numbers effectively in order to be able to make it so it's much easier to remix. Remixing still is a painful process because you have to cut through content in order to be able to do that, but we're making it so the barrier in order to do that is exceedingly small in order to be able to make that. Um, right now, this is an edit re new remix mode, but then we can switch to auto remix and continually curate and move things forward off of here. And this is only enabled because we have a centralized infrastructure of the, the largest repository of OER content that's standardized, 
uh, and hence easily remix in order to be able to do that. Try to do that with a pile of PDFs, a pile of LaTeX, a pile of Google Docs, and a pile of handwritten notes. You can't do that, um, or you have a lot more pain. So I am uh, just about over time, which is I think why Anika is now visible. Uh, so I will uh, uh, mention some quick things in terms of uh, our publishers. Uh, so our people have access uh, of being able to generate their pages, then make them in sandboxes, and then we move them out of the sandboxes in what we call publishing. Uh, once we do a review of the process to make sure that things are standardized, that that, that Canvas doesn't freak out when you bring it in because it has some limitation issues and other things like that. Um, we um, we will we will sometimes uh, use students in order to facilitate that effort uh, to allow students allow. Uh, convenient remixing of content. Um, I can't really do this uh, uh, quickly, so I will just quickly bounce through. We have community forums and chat rooms in order to facilitate communication. Uh, we have quarterly LibreFest, so we run LibreFest for specific campuses that are part of our LibreNet um, in order to be able to do a bit of professional development. If you go to youtube.libretext.org, you can take a look at that. Those LibreFests have grown to be about 150 to 200 participants per time. Um, uh, and um, there's a bit more here, but I'm not going to go over it. And, and let me just mention this. you know, We're going to have EPUB 3 export that's going to be our mechanism for handling accessibility export because PDFs are really a pain in the butt in order to make that accessible. Um, uh, we are working on a referencing system, which is something like EndNote on uh, websites, which I think is important for us to do. And the Navigator I mentioned briefly, which is our mega system in order to be able to uh, tie everything together, which I can't talk about uh, right now. And I'll mention just one thing. Uh, this is a... Um, I'll end it. As part of our ADAPT homework system, we also uh, uh, spit out a, a Libra Studio, which is our H5P uh, platform for the construction, storage, and dissemination of content uh, uh, on, our, uh, uh, on our system. So any member who works on the LibreTex and any California faculty member that even doesn't work on the LibreTex has access uh, to being able to customize, curate, uh, uh, your H5P problems, and then those can be embedded into the books or embedded into ADAPT uh, and used in a variety of different ways. Um, and and uh, we're very excited about this, and we think it's an exceedingly uh, powerful uh, mechanism that we are spitting out there. It's based off of e, uh, eCampus Ontario's uh, H5P Studio, uh, although it's all new technology on top of the underlying tool, so we didn't actually take any of that code. Um, I can keep on talking, uh, but I have a feeling that uh, I will collapse if I keep on talking at this rate. Um, and you want me to give you 10 minutes, so I will stop uh, and I can answer any questions that you may have. Thanks. Um, thank you very much. I appreciate the overview. I know we didn't give you a ton of time for that. Um, you have one question so far, which is, um, what's the pricing structure? That's a really good question. Um, because we are not a for-profit entity, um, so I have a not-for-profit uh, 5013C uh, uh, instance in order to keep things afloat. Um, we're trying to find what is the lowest amount that we can do in order to still stay viable for what we're, we're doing. Um, uh, right now, our LibreNet membership is $500 per campus per year, um, which I know is 20 times cheaper than uh, it, what I'm sure you uh, would probably uh, quote you. Uh, or what Melinda may have uh, quoted you off of that. And the reason for that is that we have um, much less costs and we don't have the financial aspect behind how we operate uh, for that. The homework system is a little bit different uh, because that requires, in order to make sure it operates uh, at scale and um, it's always on, and you need a system administrator, we need to expand it into uh, uh, a bunch of stuff. And we were thinking somewhere in the order of, five to seven dollars per student per year, which is still nothing compared to the commercial value. Um, but that's what we think we need in order to maintain those things uh, and move it forward top of that. So um, sorry to give you not a, a definitive number, but I'm a chemist, not a business person. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm slowly trying to do this because A, do I know what I'm doing in the business world? No, uh, but uh, uh, I, 
I know what I'm doing in, uh, in the OER infrastructure. And I think what we've built is exceedingly powerful. And certainly the traffic has demonstrated that. This is telling me it's time for a break, but <laughs> uh, so, yeah. Um, Thank so you. Thank it depends, upon, it depends upon what you want. If you want the professional development, if you want the, you know, uh, coming around and, and training your people at different times. Uh, so one of the things I didn't mention is uh, one of our partners in uh, California does this infrastructure in order to uh, where the fact they, they pay their faculty not to build uh, or to remix, but to build course reports or textbook reports where they basically go through and they organize what content they want to have in what chapter, whether content is on our site or off of our site, that's OER. And then we hand it off to student remixers. So I have the team and they then go through and then basically build the book for the faculty member and then come back and say, here it is. Um, this okay. is something that maybe is how Lumen operates, but because we have students doing it, it's then one hundredth the cost of what Lumen would do because uh, students are really good at being able to do these sort of things. Uh, that's out there, so. um, Tim is asking if he understood correctly that there's that provides access to an unlimited number of texts. Yeah, uh, we don't have. We, uh, I mean, our business model doesn't include. So we we don't. Uh, our business model, I know, while it doesn't sound overly developed, uh, the, the reason for that is that we didn't want to do this a la carte. If you want H5P, you get this. If you want this, you want this. If you want this, how much size? And so, I mean, we just kind of lump it all together um, and, uh, and put it down there. So we have no desire in order to limit access to anything that we do, um, at, at least currently. On, uh, on, Thank you. Other questions for Delmar? Yeah, so Delmar, what, what would you say are the major differentiators for LibreText versus other sorts of platforms that are available for people to be used for OER and OER related sort of work? That's actually quite interesting because just a handful of hours ago, uh, Hugh and I uh, submitted a, uh, a panel to Cal OER that, that we're both, he and I are going to get up there and we're going to do a comparison between uh, uh, and contrast uh, between uh, Pressbooks and LibreText. I was hoping that Melinda was going to get up there for OER Commons, but she declined um, uh, uh, for this, which is fine. Um, so the, the uh, uh, one of the key differences is the centralization approach. Uh, so by keeping everything centralized, it provides an effective mechanism for curation. In fact, I think the only major mechanism for curation, unless you implement a federated infrastructure uh, of a standardized system, which is something that um, MoodleNet is supposed to be able to handle. All of that's still been hypothetical for a period of time. Um, it, it, press books, uh, while you pay for their centralized infrastructure, um, and that might be a way in order to do that, they have a uh, facilitate a massive uh, fragmentation of, of other versions of the book everywhere. So that when someone again updates it, that's outside of their infrastructure, you don't actually benefit. And I think that that's really not very good. Uh, keeping control and keep things centralized that so when people update it, that everyone can benefit from, uh, I, I think is exceedingly important. So one of the problems that I think that the OER, the OER community needs to deal with is we're generating lots and lots of stuff, which is great, okay? Now we have to start curating because uh, the stuff is starting to uh, get old. Uh, and we haven't thought this through in terms of the full age cycle of life. I can't remember if we cradle the grave approach. Uh, and that's what a centralized infrastructure uh, that OER Commons does and LibreText does. It facilitates by default uh, integrated into it in order to be able to move it forward. And I think that's going to be a key difference between how uh, we operate. Um, the, the second thing, uh, well, the Libre versus uh, is immensely I'm trying to be tactful here. Uh, it, it provides a lot of capabilities that Pressbooks does not provide by its default. So Pressbooks is a really good uh, technology for getting the information out there. Or here's a, here's a page and distribute it because it's based off of a blog, originally a blogging software, most popular software out there for distributing content, but its back end is not, is, is limited by the technology that underlies it. Now they've done a beautiful job in order to really push it to the maximum. Um, but it doesn't have the, the brain behind the scenes in order to do all the things behind it, to do you know, the dynamic indexing infrastructure that we have, the dynamics linking, uh, all the analytics in order to pop things across different sites. There's a lot of things that, that you have behind the scenes, which is hard to justify why it's different uh, without having to rip open our system and show you 
what happens when you have a big brain versus a small brain that runs the overall system. I'm sure that he would disagree with the way that I'm describing that. Um, so um, uh, other than that, you know, they have some uh, greater capabilities right now with their EPUB uh, output, which we're going to be able to handle uh, with our Pebble infrastructure. Uh, uh, we're going to have, we certainly have a greater centralized distribution. So if the point is to be able to get your people, your students in order to find your content, there is no better platform uh, on the internet today. Uh, uh, and uh, in order to find content uh, out there, because uh, you, you can't help but trip over Libre text content uh, that, that, that we have now, in part because of how much we've grown and the way that we put that in place. Um, uh, there's a bit more additional capabilities in terms of how we host things uh, and, and more technical stuff, which is not probably what you want to, to have down there. Uh, I will have a much better description of comparison and contrast uh, in, in two months for the Cal OER when Hugh and I are both there in order to be able to put that together. I can I can share at least Delbar from hearing them present before that I, yeah, I don't know that either side really understands what the other one does. You know what I mean? Because I think that they thought they had some features that they, you know, Libertex didn't have and you might think you have some features they don't have, I guess, takes. So that'll yeah. be interesting to see how you guys kind of compare. Yeah, so that was one of the, the, the abstract I made just a few hours ago uh, it, at the end was basically for us to provide some sort of roadmap of where we want to go uh, and what we want to do. Uh, I, I will mention this, that the, there's, a, there's a distinct philosophy difference between a faculty member doing something who's creating this thing uh, or a team of faculty that are creating these things uh, that are building it and know how they want to use it versus people who are not uh, faculty members. And have a very different perspective on how they're actually going about doing that. Now, that, that doesn't mean that it's that it just is more of a, a, a side trip, but it does provide us an opportunity really quickly to say, we want this, we want this, we want this, and we're implementing those components in order to be able to submit them uh, and, and make it work effectively. Um, so that's a that's a key philosophical difference. Or maybe a philosophical is not the right thing, but there's a key characteristic difference in the way we think. So. Thank you. Great. All right. Well, I think we are pretty much at time. Um, so thank you very much, Delmar. Um, we really appreciate your presentation. Um, I will be distributing the recording. Um, so if you have any uh, slides or things, if you want me to share those with the working group, if you can send them my way, that would be great. Um, I can share those slides that I had there. The, those are largely topical slides. So I'm not sure if those are going to be overly useful for you. Uh, the sure. only thing that I would share would be our YouTube channel, so you can actually see the videos of our uh, Liberfest, and that goes into a lot of detail behind each of these uh, these aspects. Uh, and sure. And such. So yeah, we. I'll give you great. That's perfect. Um, anything you want us to distribute, we do have um, probably another twenty or so members of the working group that weren't able to join us today. So we want to make sure we give folks a chance to take a look at those things. Um, so thank you very much for joining us. Um, yeah. And um, I'm going to um, just politely ask if you could sign off and we're just going to wrap up our working <laughs> group meeting. <laughs> That's fine. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you so much. No worries. Cheers.